Gentleman yields. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January the 3rd, 2017, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Lipinski, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the minority leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days within which to revise and extend the remarks and exclude, include extraneous materials on this, the topic of this special order. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today as a member of the Climate Solutions Caucus to speak on the issue of climate change. The caucus is a bipartisan group of members committed to implementing economically viable options to reduce climate risk. The caucus has a Noah's Ark membership rule. Members can only join in pairs, one from each party. Under the leadership of co-chairs Mr. Curbelo and Mr. Deutsch, the caucus is helping to break the partisan gridlock on this issue and show that promoting climate solutions can be truly bipartisan. The formation and rapid growth of the Climate Solutions Caucus represents a recognition of both the challenges and opportunities, and it has demonstrated that there is bipartisan will to take action. In recognition of the fact that 60 members of Congress have come together to fight climate change in a bipartisan fashion, I organize this time for my colleagues to join me on the floor to let the American people know what we, as their elected leaders, are doing to address climate change. We know from scientific evidence that our climate is changing. The global average temperature has increased by about 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit over the last 100 years. Sea levels are rising. The ocean is becoming more acidic. Precipitation patterns are changing. And heat waves are becoming more frequent and longer in duration. Each of these changes produces a cascade of effects that impact our lives and livelihoods, including flooding, changes in crop yields, power, sh power shortages, declines in fisheries, and increases in cardiovascular disease. Recent events in our own country, such as devastating hurricanes in the southeast and wildfires in the west, have brought this issue to the forefront of everyone's minds. Now, climate change can't be directly blamed for all these problems, but the evidence strongly suggests that it contributes to each of them. And these are things we can do, and th there are things that we can do to limit its effects. Climate change also has a significant impact on public health. A groundbreaking study published just this week in a medical journal, The Lancet, unequivocally showed that climate change is a serious public health threat. The study involved 24 institutions from around the world and including, included staggering statistics, such as the fact that air pollution caused 1.9 million premature deaths in Asia in 2015, and that the range of common disease-transmitting mosquito increased 9.5% since 1950. We know that high temperatures exasperate, exasperate health problems and that burning fossil fuels creates pollution that causes cardiovascular disease. The National Academies estimate that air pollution causes around $120 billion per year in health-related damages, including health care costs, missed days of work and school, and premature death. We also know that changing climate has altered the range and in some cases accelerated the spread of vector-borne diseases like Zika and the West Nile virus. Responsibly transitioning to a clean energy economy will not only reduce the greenhouse gas emissions that contribute to climate change, it will also reduce air pollution and help all Americans to breathe easier. What I want to talk about for a few minutes before I turn to some of my colleagues is a very common misperception about the relationships between implementing climate solutions and growing jobs. Some people think that this is a zero-sum game. That is, they think if you have more of one, you get less of the other. But that is simply not true. 
Implementing climate solutions can grow jobs, especially new, high-paying jobs. The U.S. needs to take advantage of these economic opportunities. Regardless of what we do here in the U.S., the rest of the world has committed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions and reaching the targets laid out in the Paris Agreement, as have many cities, states, and companies here at home. To achieve that goal, significant technological development and innovation will be needed, as well as infrastructure, markets, and distribution channels to get that technology to the people in places that need it. The national economies that produce this clean, this clean energy technology will benefit greatly. The U.S. still leads the world in technology and innovation. Countries around the world try to recreate the innovation ethos that exists in Silicon Valley and in other places across our nation. The United States also has the workers that are needed to build these innovations. So we have what it takes, and if we see gaps to climate change, and America grows good-paying jobs all across our nation. But if we let this opportunity pass us by, then profits and jobs will instead flow to foreign countries that develop the technologies the world needs. And American cities and states will be forced to buy foreign products as they upgrade to climate resilient infrastructure. That's why I will soon be introducing a bill called Challenges and Prizes for Climate Act. This bill will establish five or more prize challenges overseen by the Department of Energy to harness the ingenuity of the research community in the private sector to solve big, complex climate problems. Challenges have been used in the past by a wide range of organizations, including the X Prize, which used the challenge to jumpstart the commercial space transportation industry. This industry is now flourishing. I was just recently at SpaceX in California and saw their impressive manufacturing facility they have there. The U.S. is now relying on, on SpaceX in order to bring supplies up to the International Space Station and their plans to soon be flying astronauts. This commercial space transportation industry began with those who reached to try to meet this challenge and get the X Prize. The Federal Trade Commission also used a prize challenge to help bring a robocall blocking service to the market, something that we can all very much appreciate. So that's why I'm going this direction. My bill will create challenges that fall under five themes, carbon capture and reuse, energy efficiency, energy storage, climate adaptation and resiliency, and data analytics for better climate predictions. Using authority from the America Competes Act, the Department of Energy will convene working groups from across agencies, universities, nonprofits, and the private sector to help plan the challenges and even to contribute to the prizes. The goal of the challenge is not just to reward the winner of the best solution, but also to bring visibility to the range of innovations competing for the prize and to help society envision the future. This bill will help us see what our clean energy future will look like, and I urge all my colleagues to support it. Now with that, I want to begin hearing from the bipartisan group of climate leaders who have joined me here on the floor this evening. And first, I want to yield to my Republican uh, colleague from Pennsylvania, uh, Mr. Fitzpatrick. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank my colleague, Mr. Lipinski, for uh, his leadership on this.